All righty. So we, this is part two. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. We were talking about God's dealings with sin. In part one, we were looking at the last 16 verses of, of the first chapter of Romans. And basically what this was saying is, is that um, we had, the, the, the people were sinning and, and, and they kept sinning and, and God kind of took his hand off of them and let, kind of let them over to their ways so that they would do their, so they were able to do their thing because you have a free will. However, there was very specific things that we were talking about, different sins. And the one that always jumps out at me the most is, is this idol worship thing. And again, we talked about context. You know, in the time of Rome, you know, the, the idols like he was describing were of wood and metal and all these different things, things they worship. Well, we still worship stuff. It just doesn't end up being, you know, idols of, you know, bronze snakes and all those things. We have a tendency of worshiping our stuff. You, you, you know, our jobs, our houses, our cars, whatever the case may be. So even though idol worship looks a little different now, it, it, it still happens. You know, so now and the whole point of this, this part that we were talking about last week was of how sin affects the person. You know, how, how all the different types of sin and, and, and God had, had, let, had, 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 had kind of taken his hand and turned them over to the things that they were doing and let them kind of reap the benefit of what they were doing. We saw they were getting, we were getting, depra they were getting depraved minds. They, they were not only in, engaging in sin, they were, they were okay with other people being in sin. And we saw all this. Well, this is kind of where we picked up. So going over to Romans 2, verse 1 through 16. It says this, the first two verses say, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. There are volumes being spoken in just two verses. First of all, this, this, this whole thing about you have no excuse you know, we, we sin. You know, we like to judge sinners. We, we might not necessarily be doing some of the things that were on that list last week, but we are sinners, and we like to point our fingers at other sinners. You, you know, it's, I think it's even worse, and especially because Paul stresses it, especially when we, we talk about them doing things, and we judge them for doing things, and we are doing the same things. You know, there's, there's, there's an issue there. But, and where do we see this thing? Where, I think of a story that just, just jumps out at me where it talks about you who are condemning yourselves because you who pass judgment do the same things. I think about the story of a guy named David. David, you know, we know his, we know his, his deal. We, we know the fact that, you know, he, he was being lazy. He didn't go to war like he was supposed to, with all the, like all the kings do. And then he saw Bathsheba, and he sins for her, and he gets her pregnant. Well, then it's like, now I've got a problem. I've got a pregnant lady, and her husband's off at war. You know, and so he brings her husband back you know, to try to encourage her to sleep with, with, with his wife, to try to say, you know, hey, it's his baby. He, you know, and then what's, he's, he's like, I can't do that. We talk, about, we talk about Memorial Day and people who live and die by, by honor. Her husband's like, I, I can't sleep with her. My my. I feel it just doesn't feel right. My buddies are on the battlefield, and, and, and I'm supposed to be here, so he doesn't sleep with her. So now what's David got to do? David has to do this thing where he, he tells his, his general to, to send her husband to the front, and then when the battle gets intense, pull them back. So what's he doing? He's killing this guy. He's having him murdered. So Nathan, Nathan the prophet, now I'll tell you what, there, there are people in the Bible that when I read their story, I think, I would never want to be that guy. Nathan was one of these guys. Because let me tell you about Nathan. Let me tell you about kings. If you, had, if you displeased a king, and I'm not just talking about Israel's kings, I'm talking about kings in general, all through history. If you angered a king, you had a way of becoming dead. And, and, and we, we can honestly say from the life of David, David didn't have a problem making people dead. You know, that was one of those things where, you know, why wasn't he allowed to, to build the temple? 
you know, because he had blood on his hands. You know, so David didn't have an issue with making people dead. So now Nathan has a story to bring him. God sends Nathan the prophet, and he tells him the story. He says, okay, King David, let's just say there's, a, there's this poor guy, and he has this little ewe lamb. And he loves the ewe lamb, and he cares for it. It eats off of his plate. And I mean, it's, it's like a child to him. You, you know, that he just loves, loves his little lamb. It's all he has. It's the thing he values in life more than anything else. Of course, this is the, this is the Greg paraphrase, but you get the point. And he says, okay, now the rich guy who had lots and lots of sheep, you, you know, he's going to have a party. His buddies are coming over. He's going to have a party. So he has his servants go and take the little ewe lamb from the guy to take it and to kill it and to serve it to his friends. And Nathan essentially says, well, what do you think should happen to this guy? And David gets ticked off. He's like, that son of a gun? He deserves, he deserves, the, the, he deserves death. I mean, he deserves, he just, he just, he's a bad guy. I can't believe this. Who is this guy? And, and what's Nathan have to say? Can you picture this? Put yourself in this context. To a king. A king who doesn't mind making you dead, he has to say it's you. Could you imagine that? Here's where Nathan lucks out. It's not even luck, it was a God thing. Here's where a God thing happened for Nathan. David received the correction. And he's like, wow, I've messed up. So what happened with David after that, though? The same type of judgment that he was passing on that guy that when he didn't realize that Nathan was talking about him, that is kind of the judgment that he experienced. David's household never knew peace after this moment. I, I mean, his own, his own son tried to kill him. I mean, there was uprisings. There was issues. David's life was a, not necessarily a happy place from this point forward because he passed a judgment and that judgment was, was given to him in like manner. Do you think that maybe that could happen to us? Mind you, here's what's important about this. David never stopped being David. He never stopped being king. He never stopped being Jewish. He never stopped being anything. But because of the judgment that he passed on somebody that he didn't realize was him, that same measure of judgment was passed on to him. So do you think that sometimes when we're being super critical of other people, and we're, we're, we're looking to down on them about their sin, those horrible people. They do these awful things that God says don't do. And these rotten. Do you think that when we're judging them in that way, do you think that maybe we might be bringing judgment upon ourselves? Let's read this, this, is, let's read this passage again. You therefore have no excuse. You have passed judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another. Mind you, this is Paul talking to the church. For at whatever point you, that you judge another, you are condemning yourselves because you who pass judgment do the same things. So it's not saying that because that you do this that you're going to lose your salvation. You're not going to be a Christian anymore. You're not going to do any of these things. However, it does mean that judgment can be coming into your life. Because do you think that God disciplines people? He absolutely disciplines people. The discipline of God, though, is, 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 is intended to curb behavior. It's not, we talked about discipline versus punishment. It's not just bad you, bad you, bad you, you did something bad, I'm going to whack you on the, on the tail end. That's not what, that's punishment. When God disciplines us, it's because he loves us and he doesn't want us to do stupid things anymore. So that's, that's the discipline of God. Well, you want to know it sometimes that discipline, I think we ask for it because we judge people. I think we do it more than what we even realize. I, 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 here's, a, here's a homework assignment for you. Think over the next week of a group of people that, that, that you just, just don't feel comfortable around. You don't like what they do. You don't like what they say. What, you know, would, it be, would, it be, would it be the homeless folks? Would it, would it be the gay folks? Would it be somebody who doesn't look like you? And you want to know what? 
I want you to evaluate your own response to them. Because if you are judging them based on the things that they do or where they're from or the fact that they look different from you, you are bringing judgment on yourself, according to Paul. And to be honest, we probably need that judgment. We need that discipline. Because if we're going to be like Christ, we're not going to look at people because of their social economic status, because of the things that they do, or because they look different from us. We're going to love them because they are made in the image of God. I mean, this is, this is, Paul was speaking volumes just in verse 1. Verse 1 is something that you can build a sermon around verse 1. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Here's the problem with error judgments. They're usually not based in truth. Error judgments are based on how we rate sin. Error judgments are based on how we look at people. Error judgments are sometimes based on error prejudices or, or something that we, there's a sin that we find particularly offensive. So we judge people based on our group or our, our way of categorizing things. But you want to know what? It's not true. Error judgments can't be in truth. Why? Because we don't know everything. We don't see everything. We can't look at somebody's life and say, oh, they're a sinner they're living a, a, a bad, bad life. Shame on them because we don't know what put them there. We don't know what got them in that circumstance. We don't know any of those things. So when we pass judgment on somebody and we've not walked a mile or two or three in their shoes, we are wrong. But God's judgment and God's discipline is based on truth. It's where the rubber meets the road. God is a good judge. He is a good king. When he makes judgments, it's based on reality. It's based on truth. It's based on justice. Oh my goodness, justice. There's a scary word. Justice. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Let me tell you something about my God. Do we see judgment passed anywhere in the Bible? Let's, let's, just, look at the, let's just look at the first half. Well, it's more than the first half. Let's just look at the Old Testament. Do we ever see God's judgment being passed anywhere in the Old Testament? We absolutely do. We see him, even with his own, his chosen people, you know, give them opportunity to you know, repent, stop messing up, come back to me, your first love, you know, love me, love me, don't love that stuff, love me. And then at a certain point, and, and they keep rejecting him and rejecting him and rejecting him, God's judgment would pass. And, and discipline would step in. And I know I've talked about this a hundred times, but it's so important for us to understand. We look at the exiles, as horrible as they are, do you think that maybe that had something to do with God's judgment? Do you think it had something to do with his discipline? I think it did. Did it work? It absolutely worked. As horrible as it was, I can't even imagine being Jeremiah. You know, we like to call him, well, he's the weeping prophet. He was watching Jerusalem. We, I would be weeping if I saw the, the city and the people I love being destroyed and carried off. You, you know, when I, when I see things like that, I, I think, man, that's, I, how could anything good come out of that? Well, let me tell you what. Mind you, that God didn't put them in exile. Like we were talked about in chapter 1, sometimes he releases his hand off and allows things to happen. Well, that's exactly what happened here. He took his hand, his protective hand away for a period of time, and first the Assyrians came and took the north, and then after that the Babylonians came and took the south, and then the Babylonians ended up having everybody. But what was about the exile? What good could have come out of that? What stuff was, were the Hebrew people doing before the exile? Before the exile, they, kept, they, they, kept, they, would, they would intermingle with other countries, their, their people, and they would start taking on their ways. They would start worshiping idols. They would do all these different things. They would stop, they would stop living according to the covenant that God had made with Abraham. There, was, there wasn't a... 
The Ten Commandments should be very easy to follow. He made it really easy. I, I mean, if you, were, if you were like a priest and you had, to, you had to know all the little rules around the tabernacle, that would have been more complicated stuff. But the law was contained in ten little rules. And they didn't follow them. Well, you want to know it? Let's not be so judgmental of the, of the Jewish people. And when Jesus came, he, he drummed it down into two rules. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor like yourself. Jesus made it super simple. But do we still violate those laws? Do we still violate that thing? Are there people that we don't love? Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? When you, the, the loving somebody as yourself, when you love yourself, you always look after your own interest first. That's kind of the, 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 the default setting in you. You look out for yourself first. We all have this little piece of self-centeredness. We all have this little piece of narcissism that makes us want to make sure that we're taken care of. So when we love another the way we love ourselves, we are looking out after their own interests just as much as we would ours. So when we are not loving and we are passing judgment because there's something about them that we don't like. We are violating the law of God. We are violating God's law. And, and if we continue to violate God's love, if we continue to hate people because of where they're from, what they look like, or the things that we've done, if we keep doing this, God's judgment will fall. And you want to know what? It should. It should. You know, I'm not asking for an exile. But did the exile work? Yeah. All the things that the Hebrew people were doing, they stopped doing it after the exile. I have, have, you, have you ever seen, have you ever seen a Jewish person with an idol now? No. Some of the biggest clashes between the Hebrews and Rome and, and the area of Judea were things that were like putting images on even the money. Because it was a graven image. So the very stuff that they had no issue with before the exile, they were ready to fight to the death for after the exile. So if we keep doing, if we keep doing the things, and I'm, I know I'm going to kind of, kind of parallel with the thing that I, I said a few weeks ago, I think Billy Graham said, but if we keep doing the stuff that we do, and God's judgment doesn't fall on us, God owes the Jewish people an apology for the exile. And let me tell you what, it's not coming because it was just. So if we continue to hate or we continue to violate God's laws with zero disregard, judgment will come. You know what? We're the best thing out there in America. I said, I love, 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 love my country. But we can't continue to do the things we do and expect to stay in His good grace. Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? What is He talking about? Let's go back to the Old Testament. The times He passed judgment. The times where, where bad things happened to the Jewish people. Do you realize... He didn't just tell them, come back to me once. And then when they didn't, he sent them off to Assyria. That's not the way that went down. He over and over and over and over and over showed them grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And I know, I know I've said this a hundred times, but it's so important that the grass... If I were God, I'm telling you, the Mount Sinai thing would have gone way different. I would have zapped every single one of us. I would have been done. I would have been done. A after delivering you from Egypt and, and, and saving you through the sea and all these things, and just because Moses is gone a little bit longer than you think he should have been gone, you're going back to your old ways, I would have been done with you. But why wasn't he? Because of his kindness, his forbearance, and his patience. Mind you, there were some in there. The judgments did, did pass. The people who 
the people who rebelled against Moses, they didn't see the, they didn't see the promised land. When God, plants, when God plants a leader in your assembly and you rebel, but not, because they are, not because they are doing something unbiblical, but because they are following the direction that God has given them, there's consequences. Look at mo- the people who, 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 who rebelled against Moses. And this isn't, this isn't one of those things, hey, you've got to listen to me. That's not what this is. But there were still, even with his patience, his kindness, and his forbearance, even then still, there was sometimes judgment. Those people who spoke out against Moses, they didn't see the promised land. They had to keep wandering and wandering and wandering until they were all dead. In fact, some of them got swallowed up pretty quick. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. Do you realize we have come out of an era, probably out of the last century, of the fire and brimstone preacher? I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. There is a place for the fire and brimstone preacher. I, I, it's not. However, the fire and brimstone preacher misses something. It's okay every once in a while to shock people. It's okay every once in a while to say, okay, you know. Sin is scary. It's okay every now and then. But that's not the character of God. God's character is that His patience, His forbearance, and His kindness is what leads us to Him, not fear. Because when we talk about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about being reverent to Him. We're not talking about being scared of Him. God does not want to scare you. God wants to, through His kindness, his forbearance, and his patience to, to bring you into his presence. You know, the Bible talks about that we can boldly approach our Father. Boldly. Why is that? Because regardless of all the stupid stuff that we do, he is kind, he shows forbearance and patience. And the little thing called the righteousness of Christ. <laughs> And that's not a little thing. That was a little bit of sarcasm. The big thing of the righteousness of Christ. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself in the day of God's wrath when His his righteous judgment will be revealed. I actually want to move forward because we have to... We can't take that one scripture out of the next few, and it has to be in context. God will repay each person according to what he has done, what they have done. To those who have persisted in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. We have to plug this in with with the other teachings of Paul. This isn't to say that for the believer, wrath is coming. There is a situation where, because he's talking to he's talking to the, the, the Roman people and the and the church at the same time here. If you reject God's truth, do believers reject God's truth? Do believers follow evil? Are they self-seeking? Remember, love is not self-seeking. Here's another Paul thing. So if you, if, if you are not a believer, and you are seeking after yourself instead of good and honorable things, judgment day is not going to be a friendly place. Because here's where God's judgment and truth, here's where it plays in. If you face judgment as an unbeliever, every single thing you have ever done, every white lie, every every time you've, you've, you've cheated on your wife or your husband, every single time that you've you've lied about anything or anything you've done, it has not gone unnoticed by God. Remember, I, I talked about the jumbotron thing, how 
You know, I, I, as, a, as a young guy, I was thinking that the believers had the jumbotron and all your unforgiven sin, which doesn't exist, and I understand that now, but everything you didn't ask for forgiveness for was shown to the whole world. Well, I'll tell you what, that jumbotron just might exist for an unbeliever. Because the judge who sees everything and judges in truth is, are going to pay these folks for every single thing that they've done. Every single time they beat the dog. Now, let me tell you what, there's some scriptures about kindness to animals. God cares about animals. Every time you got mad to meet the dog. Every single thing you've ever done. If you are not a believer, it has not been unnoticed, and it will be paid for in full. But those of us, but those of us for whom there is no condemnation, does judgment play a little bit into this? Well, well we can see the, a spiritual kind of truth in some of the parables where we see that, 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 that some who worked a lot for, the, for, for God, they were rewarded more than those who didn't. Of course, there was, there was also other parables that just show it doesn't matter if you've served your whole life or just on your deathbed kind of deal. I mean, you're in, you're in. You, you, you know. So do you think that even as a believer, do you think that judgment might play in just a little bit, not in a condemning way, but if you're judging others and you're hating on others, and actually there's a problem there anyway because John tells us that if you hate your brother, you don't love God. Do you think that maybe you could be diminishing even your, your, your reward in heaven? Well, the, here's the thing about that. I think there's a possibility you could be. Just getting in is enough. Just getting in is enough. I would rather spend one day in heaven guarding the gate than a thousand years on a beach someplace here. Heaven's just going to be that cool. But here's the, the important thing to gather out of this. When it comes to God's judgment, know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, you're going to have a know Jesus moment. Because Jesus came the first time in the incarnation as the, the Lamb of God. He came the first time and was born in a stable. With, with and, and his his his. His birth was announced to Levitical shepherds, and he had a very humble beginning. That's the way Jesus came the first time. Jesus isn't coming back that way. When we saw the Battle of Hymn of the Republic song, you saw that, that cool picture of Jesus up in the corner. I don't know if you looked at the picture where he's coming back with the armies of God. Here's the thing that we haven't even ever known in the field of battle, except maybe the Gulf War. That when you have a, an armed conflict and, and, and the invading army is coming in, not, not very often did the, 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 the bad guys turn themselves into CNN reporters. For the most part, it was a dogfight. And there was this thing where there was some retreat, go forward, retreat, go forward. You look at the trench warfare of World War I, I can't even wrap my head around what that would have been like. But when Jesus comes back, there will be no retreat and any resistance will be put down in the twinkling of an eye. Do you get this Armageddon picture? All the nations, and this is what scares me about America, folks. This is what scares me about America. I see Christian media. I've seen movies where, where they're trying to kind of show Armageddon, and, and, and the people are coming against Israel, but the Americans show up and save Israel. It says that all nations will be against Israel. So you want to know what? If we're still around, guess who's going to be against Israel on that day? Us. There's going to be one protector of Israel when the whole world comes against her. When God comes back, when Jesus comes back, there is no retreat. And, and the whole valley of Armageddon will be filled with blood. And it's not Jesus's. Jesus is done bleeding. He already, he already paid his price. But if you reject the truth and follow evil, God's dealings with sin, it's not going to be pretty. Some, I've been asked many times, why did Jesus have to die such a brutal death? You know, 
That's a legitimate question. Why would he have to die such a brutal death? Couldn't they just like stab him in the heart with a spear and it'd be done? I believe the reason that Jesus had to die such a brutal death is because God was making a point about the seriousness of your sin. It was a big sin debt, and it required a big price. But my Jesus, mm -mm -mm. when he comes back, He's not coming back as the he's not coming back as, as, as the lowly, humble person, low to the ground. He's coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Read the back of Revelation. <laughs> can't even imagine, can't even picture that. I don't care how good Hollywood is, they can't reproduce that. Messiah, Jesus, riding back on a white horse. With the word of, of, the, of the, the word of God, the sword of the Spirit coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations. God's judgment is going to be hard on the unbelievers. Why is that? I guess I'm sounding a little fire and brimstone right now. I don't mean to be. But why? Why is God's judgment going to be so hard in the last day? Because all you had to do to escape it. Let's say, Jesus, I love you. I want you to be my king. I believe you came. I believe you died. I believe you're at the right hand of the Father, and I believe you're bringing me home with you. That's all you needed to do. If you couldn't do that, if you couldn't give yourself to a God who gave himself to you first, maybe you deserve hell. Actually, I deserve it anyway. My sins made me worthy of nothing but hell. But I was fortunate enough that I answered the call of God and said, Jesus, I love you. I need you. Please take over because I can't do this without you. If you reject that kind of gift, do you think, do you think that, the, that these folks don't deserve the wrath of God? Here's the... Let's bring this into even more perspective. Does God send people to hell? He absolutely does not. God does not send people to hell. People send people to hell. Why? What do I mean? There are two kings. There's King Jesus. There's King Lucifer. We made, we in our sin made Satan the king. You are going to follow your king to their destination. Does God make you follow Satan to hell? Absolutely not. God doesn't send people to hell. People send people to hell by rejecting the free gift of Christ. That's how you get yourself to hell. God didn't send you there. Matthew 28. The people he doesn't know. Depart ye cursed... That sounds almost like the King James Version. Depart ye cursed in the everlasting fire prepared for who? The devil and his angels. Hell was not made for people. Hell was not made for you. Hell was made as a punishment for the rebellion of Satan against God. So you follow your king. Are you going to follow God? Are you going to follow King Jesus to heaven? Are you going to follow King Lucifer to hell? That's a choice everybody has to make. Here's the other interesting thing about that. By not accepting King Jesus, you are automatically accepting King Satan. It's as simple as that. You were born into sin. The Bible says you were born children of Satan. That's a That's a... That's a rough thing to say, but it's true. So God doesn't send people to hell. Anybody who tells you, well, why would a loving God send people to hell? You can tell them God doesn't send people to hell. He sent Jesus to rescue them from hell. They choose to go there. There will be 
there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. Let's turn this thing around a little bit. Remember how I said I used to be kind of jealous of the Jewish folks because everything was first to the Jew and then to the Gentile? Well, let me tell you what, it goes both ways. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who, goes, who does evil first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So not only does salvation come first to the Jews, judgment comes first. That, that would be something that I, I would like to escape. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Do you realize... We've all heard Eric call us spiritual Jews. Do you realize he's on to something there? I don't know. I don't know about next week. I don't know if I'm going to continue in chapter 2 because, like I said, if we do an expositional, uh, an expositional uh, 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 study of the book of Romans, we'll be here for a very long time. But the very next thing in the second chapter of Romans talks about Jews and the law. And everything that Eric's ever told you about being a spiritual Jew, it's in Romans chapter 2, the, from where we're leaving off all the way to the end. It's true. God doesn't show favoritism. Why? Because he doesn't see any differences anymore. All the barriers are gone. Why are the barriers gone between Jews and Gentiles? Because of Jesus. We are all one. We, we as Gentiles... We had it really cool. We had a cool thing. We didn't even have to pay the price the Jewish people did through the Old Testament. While God was protecting the bloodline of the Messiah, we got to be an engrafted vine and just get to enjoy all the benefits. I'll tell you, that's kind of a cool thing if you're a Gentile. What's a Gentile? Anybody that's not a Jew. But God doesn't show favoritism because God doesn't see you any differently anymore. It doesn't matter if you are from the line of any of the 12 tribes of Judah or, if you, or of the tribes of Israel, I'm sorry, forgive me, any of the 12 tribes of Israel. It doesn't matter if you're from America or Russia or China or any place. It doesn't matter who the people are. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, God sees you no differently. You are all one. So we are spiritual Jews. We are. God shows no favoritism, even in judgment. Do you realize that, that, yeah, if you don't know Jesus, judgment's going to be horrible. If you do know Jesus, when all this end time stuff happens, you've got nothing to worry about. But is he, still, is he showing favoritism to us? Because we've accepted Christ. He's not showing favoritism. We are merely following our king to their destination. Do you know he loves the ones who walk themselves to hell just as much as he loves you and I? He doesn't play favorites. We do. Is their favorite Jesus or is their favorite Satan? That's what it boils down to. Who's their favorite? Who's their favorite? Is Jesus your favorite or is Satan your favorite? All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and, and those who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by na nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. What does that mean? First of all, when it's talking about the Jewish people or, or people who, who know the law, and even us now, remember we're spiritual Jews, if we abide by the law, that is the thing that we're going to be, that's going to be the measuring stick. But I've often had people ask, well, does God send people to hell? And I'm not making fun of people. I'm just, if, does, God people send, does God send people to hell if they were in a jungle someplace and they never heard Jesus and didn't know anything? Does God send people to hell like that? Because, you, you know, that doesn't seem very fair to me. Well, this tells me that he doesn't. Because you are held accountable when you know. Here's this thing about when you don't know. We're talking about the, the little guys in, in the jungles of, of different places in the world that have never heard the name of Jesus, doesn't know all this stuff, 
God builds, God has written his statutes on all of our hearts, even if you don't realize it. That's why you can go centuries ago into a jungle in Africa and you will see where it is not natural for a father to have a sexual relationship with their child, even in the jungles. Why is that? Because even though they've never heard of the law, they've never heard of Jesus, they've never heard of any of those things, God has written his statutes on their hearts. And that, that law is, is there. You know, killing, for the most part, for people, even if they've had no contact with Torah or anything in the Bible, it's there. So they will be judged. By, by the thing, by, by the, the thing written on their hearts. Why? Because God is not an unfair God. He is a just God. Would it be a just God who sends people who've never heard the name of Jesus to hell? No. But are there people that in these places that they even violate the law that's on their heart, that's been written on their heart? They absolutely do. So they will be, they will be judged according to the thing that... that, that the, the thing that God has written in their heart. This goes on. Let's not end it there. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times defending them. So what does, what does all this mean? So those who, who, who perish outside of the law, who've never heard Torah, never heard anything about the laws and statutes of God, have never heard Jesus, they will be judged by what is written on their hearts with their conscience being kind of that guide. So no, he doesn't send people to hell who've never heard the name of Jesus, who know nothing about God. Do we see evidence that this is a real thing, that God really does this? Look at the pictures from, from, from the early times. They're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping different things, heavenly bodies. Why do they do that? Because God has written on their hearts and in their spirit the desire to worship a greater, higher being. It's written in there. That's that God-sized hole. And here's the thing now. Now that you know, now that you know the deal, now that you know you fall under the law because you know the law and you know the way to escape the punishment of the law is by accepting Christ because those who are in Christ Jesus, for them there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. The last verse, and this will take place when, God's, when God judges people's secrets through Christ Jesus. As my gospel declares, God's dealing with sin. The 40, the forty second wrap up of two lessons. God writes on your hearts what's right and what's wrong. You've been a blessed people enough to have a Bible. You have a Bible that contains Torah, the, the writings, the teachings to tell you what's right and wrong. You have a Bible that explains to you that a Messiah was coming and he would deliver his people. You have a Bible that tells you Jesus is that Messiah and that there is no forgiveness of sins apart from him. There is only one way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. If you are aware of, of, of the law, if you are aware of Jesus, there is no way, no way to get to the Father through any other way except through Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus. There is one mediator between God and man, and it is Jesus Christ. And if you choose to reject that truth, if you choose now that you know to reject that truth, judgment is coming. If you want to keep sinning, we saw in chapter 1, he's going to let you keep sinning but you're going to pay the consequences. But you as a believer, oh, thank you, Jesus, you as a believer, you don't have to face the end on your own righteousness. You are given that, 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 right, that, that garment of, of salvation, that garment of the, the righteousness of Christ. So when God the Father, and actually more specifically at judgment time, King Jesus, who becomes the judge of everyone, when he sees you, what does he see, believers? His own righteousness. 
he doesn't see the stupid stuff that you did. He just sees that you've accepted the gift that he gave you. Want to know another cool thing? When you accept Jesus, there's this Blam's, there's this book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Your name gets written in it. Your name gets written in it. So when they go through those names, if your name's on there, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. How do you get your name in there? Accept the gift. You want to escape judgment? Accept the gift. If you're watching this on YouTube, you want to talk about this, please contact the church. Accept the gift.